Hey there, rednecks, preppies, redneck preppies. It's me, the redneck preppy. How you doing today? Great, good. It's January. I'm still recovering from all the hustle and the bustle of the past month. So I'm going to pick some low-hanging pieces of fruit and do a top five list. I feel like I finally sold out on YouTube. At any rate, I thought I'd list my personal top five favorite military surplus rifles and explain why they're on that list. Now, I'm going to say at the outset, this is a completely subjective exercise. And if you want to point out that there are better candidates for a list than my five, well, then take it to the comments, Mac, because I ain't having any of it. At any rate, let's get into it. I remember back in the late 1970s or early 1980s as a wee little lad watching John Huston's The Man Who Would Be King and absolutely loving it. And over the years you could add movies like Gunga Din, Zulu, Zulu Dawn and others to that list. And what was the common thread in all of those movies besides stiff upper lips and red coats? The Martini Henry Rifle. Now. There are many different models and variants, so I'm not going to specify which specific Martini Henry. At the end of the day, they all work exactly the same. So I'm going to pull this Martini Henry Mark IV to represent all of them. Now, why do I love this rifle enough to put it in my top five? It was the rifle that built Queen Victoria's empire. It was in the hands of soldiers from Canada to Afghanistan to Somalia and everywhere else that the sun was on the British Empire. It fired a round that seemed to exist to tell people that it meant business. It was there for some of England and its colonies most bitterest moments like Isan Luana, but also for triumphs like the modest war. Yeah, by the end of its lifetime, it was completely outclassed by rifles that fired more modern rounds and often out of magazine-fed systems. But the romance and the adventure that I attach to this rifle will always mark it as the embodiment of its age. The Martini Henry is number five on my list. Mauser rifles had such an impact in war during the first half of the 20th century that it's difficult to understate their importance. The Germans carried them during two world wars, and the Americans carried a rifle in those same conflicts that was so beholden to the Mauser, in the form of the M1903 Springfield, that they paid royalties to the very country whose soldiers they were firing them at. The Israelis even used them as part of their struggle to carve out their ancient homeland with. But for me, the Mauser that exemplifies all of them is the Car 98K of World War II. Mauser may have made better rifles than the Car 98K at some point, and I have a fair collection of Mausers going back to the 1870s, so I can judge. But it is this rifle that I love the most. Yeah. It was used by the Third Reich, but one shouldn't blame the paintbrush for the painting. So why do I love the Car 98K? Man, working the bolt of one of these is like putting suntan lotion on your girlfriend's shoulders. It just goes so smooth. And this rifle makes that distinctive sound, kind of like how you know that you're hearing a Lee Enfield even with your eyes closed. It's accurate, fairly handy, and exudes quality. That's why the Car 98K is fourth on my list. Next up, it's a rifle that I've long complained about. Well, my example in particular, thanks to some gas port issues. But despite that, I still love this rifle more than most. Say hello to the SVT-40 of the Soviet Union. Wait a minute, this doesn't feel right. This does not feel right, hold on. There, now this makes sense. It was born of a nation that is stereotyped as uh, one of turnips and hefty babushkas, but whenever I see an SVT-40, I see a lith Russian supermodel. And like your typical Russian supermodel, it's temperamental and demanding. But when things are going right, man, it's a good time. 
It was Tokarev's answer to Stalin's demand for a Soviet version of an M1 Garand, and it was appreciated by both Soviet and German soldiers, the latter of whom happily took the rifle from dead or surrendered enemy soldiers. It fires that booming 7.62 by 54 millimeter R round, and all things considered, it was reasonably accurate, though it did fail as a sniper rifle. But the only knock I can make on this rifle is that it fires a rimmed cartridge. And they only did that because the Soviets didn't want to complicate their logistics, so they made this graceful beauty fire the same round as the aforementioned Babushka, the M9130. At the end of the day, no woman is perfect. Number three on my list, the SVT-40. A few minutes ago, I mentioned the M1 Garand, and here she is, number two on my list. What can you say about a rifle that was so advanced and capable in 1936 that some people argue that she's still a somewhat viable choice on the battlefield today? As Ian McCollum has said, it's obsolescent, not obsolete. And what's not to love about this rifle? I love the sound of its action. Mm. Oh, I love that. I love its form. I love the 30-06 cartridge it fires. Even that damn ping, which has created so many ridiculous myths. Ah, yes, that's the sound. Oh, it's something I never get tired of. I love shooting this rifle. Yeah, she's a heavy babe compared to the plastic fantastic of today at about 10 pounds. She is, however, a reliable lady. And in the hands of American soldiers in World War II, she gave the U.S. a decided battlefield advantage against the bolt-action rifles of Germany and Japan. While I never quite got the insistence for a fixed internal magazine and its N-block reloading clips over a rational and available detachable box magazine, an American soldier up against stripper clip fed bolt actions could pour fire compared to his enemies. It's not my favorite military surplus rifle of all time, but if this was the only one I could own, I wouldn't be too upset. But what is my most beloved military surplus rifle of all time? What wood and steel lady makes me smile every time I see her? Well, the answer might surprise many of you. Wondering where the Lee Enfield is, or why have I not mentioned something like a Moss 36? Well, both are fine rifles, and a Lee Enfield probably makes it in my number six spot. But my number one favorite military surplus rifle is the M1 carbine. Now, let me be honest with you. When the zombie apocalypse happens, I'm grabbing either an AR-15 or an SKS-45. Yes, that's another one that did not make the top five before I head out in the woods. The only reason I'm not grabbing the M1 carbine is ammunition availability. But if that was not a consideration, I'm taking the little carbine that could and with no apologies. And what's to apologize for? It's light, it's handy, and if you do your job, it's as accurate as hell. Heck, even with this short length of pull, something that causes me issues with the SKS-45, I shoot this rifle better than I do most. Now sure, I could knock this for its primary issue, reliable magazines. Now I own several, but there are really only a few that I can count on not to cause feed issues. But that's what you get when you make magazines that are essentially single use. Now, I am not counting the power of the ammunition as a negative. It was not designed to ground and pound targets like the 30-06. It does what it was intended to do. But if you think 30 carbine is a weak round that can be stopped by winter jackets, feel free to go stand about 300 yards away from me while I start taking aim at you. But look past that. You got your little baby Yoda M1 Garand-esque action, one that when you cycle it either manually uh, or fire it, makes a sound as beautiful as an Elizabeth Harley smile. Now, my perception of this carbine may be colored by the fact that I have to wait years before I could get my hands on one, since they don't exactly rain out of the skies up here in Canada. 
perhaps one too many World War II movies growing up as a kid created a thirst and an affection for it. Whatever the reason, if I had to limit myself to one military surplus rifle for the rest of my life at this moment, I'd probably pick the M1 carbine. Of course, ask me tomorrow, that might change. So what'd you think of my list? Utterly ridiculous or defensible? What would you have put in your top five list? Honestly, there are no wrong answers. Feel free to fill up the comments section arguing about it. I'll read all of your answers. At any rate, I hope you found today's video at least be vaguely entertaining and mildly informative. As always, I hope your trips to the range, regardless of what you take out, are always a great time. Take care, and bye-bye.